Some time later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph and he attended them. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream one night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, Why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to him, In my dream I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup in his hand. This is what it means, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, Remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favourable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and impale your body on a pole, and the birds will eat away your flesh. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of the officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he impaled the chief baker, just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. So we pick up our look again at Joseph and his relationship with God. If anyone knew about unfair treatment, about mistreatment, about being an an innocent victim on the receiving end, it was Joseph. First he received unfair treatment from his family. His brothers hated him and wanted to kill him, but sold him into slavery instead. He became a slave in a land where he didn't know the language. One minute he was a 17-year-old with his whole life ahead of him. The next he was totally at the mercy of some stranger. Following all that, he was falsely accused. After earning the favour of his master, it was to feel as though he had been forgotten by God. But Joseph was being refined, being shaped for greatness. All of whom God uses are first hidden in the secret of his presence, away from the pride of man. God is working while his people are waiting. Potiphar had Joseph put into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. In what could have been the dreariest of places, Joseph prospered. Because of this, he was freed up to be used by God in the lives of at least two men. This prison was the place where state prisoners were held. It was to here the court magistrates who had fallen under suspicion were sent. Chief Butler and Chief Baker do not seem much to us, but they were titles for very important people. A cupbearer was the person who tasted the wine and food of the king before he ate or drank. He would not allow poorly prepared food to be served to the pharaoh since he was responsible for watching the monarch's diet. This led to a very close relationship. 
a relationship of trust between two men. Often the king of the land would confide in the cupbearer. We might recall Nehemiah was a cupbearer to his king and had a close personal relationship with him. In many ways, the cupbearer was the most trusted man of the court. If that trust was broken, serious consequences followed. Something like that must have happened because the cupbearer to Pharaoh landed in jail, as had the king's baker. He was another person on whom the Pharaoh relied because whatever he prepared passed into the mouth of the Egyptian ruler. We're not given the specific reason why there was this falling out. All we know is that they offended their leader and he was furious with his two officials. Whatever it was it made Pharaoh so angry that he had them thrown into jail. And since God's ways are deep and profound, it happened to be the same jail where Joseph was imprisoned. Such men would talk freely with Joseph and in doing so would give him a great insight into political parties and a knowledge of men and court generally, which in later days must have been of great use to him. It is always an aversion in the mind of troubles to minister to others. Joseph found it so. It must have been a welcome relief to the monotony of his daily round when he found himself entrusted with the care of the royal prisoners. A new interest came into his life, which helped to relieve the burden of his own troubles through listening to tales of those who were in similar circumstances to himself. It is interesting to note what a deep human interest Joseph took in the separate cases of his charges, noticing the expression of their faces, inquiring kindly after their welfare, sitting down to listen to their dreams. If anyone ought to have a sad face, it should have been Joseph. His plight was much worse than theirs. They were there on a whim of the Pharaoh and surely would not be there forever. But Joseph had been accused by the chief executioner's wife and didn't know if he'd ever see the light of day again. But in spite of his own circumstances, he noticed the plight of these two men. When your heart is right, even though the bottom may have dropped out of your life, it is remarkable how sensitive we can be to someone else in need. They don't even have to spell it out. Here, rather than saying, you think you have a lot to complain about? Listen to my, my telephone. Joseph said, why are you so sad today? What's wrong? This shows Joseph's ability to think beyond his own immediate cares and in order to minister to others. What must Joseph have thought when the two men said, we've had a dream and there is no one to interpret it? They were worried about a dream that each had and could not interpret. How little did they know that they had the dreamer of all dreamers sitting in their midst? If your life is woven with the dark shades of sorrow, do not wallow in your hapless loss. Arise and seek out those who are more miserable than you. If unable to give practical help, you need not abandon yourself to the gratification of lonely sorrow. But, like Joseph, you can listen to the tales of woe and bitterness of others. It is a great art to be a good listener. The burdened heart longs to pour out its tale to a sympathetic ear. And so the sorrow will turn away from those engaged in the full rush of active life who are too busy and seek out those who, like themselves, are suffering and are obliged to go softly, like Joseph was, with these servants of Pharaoh. If you can do nothing else, listen well and comfort others with the comfort you have experienced from God. And as you listen and comfort, you will discover that your own load is lighter and you will get what Joseph got, the key which will unlock the heavy doors by which you have been shut in. Joseph might have said, I give up. Of what profit is my godliness? I might as well do as others do. How much nobler was his course of goodness? Do right because it is right to do right. Because God sees what you do and puts gladness into the heart. So when you are misunderstood or ill-treated, you will not swerve or despair or give up. We must remember that Joseph was only able to minister to the men, that it was only possible 
because the Lord was first and foremost in Joseph's life. Because he was free of bitterness, he became a useful instrument in the mighty hand of God. There is no hint of resentment, hostility or desire for vengeance in the verses we read here. And so Joseph listens to the dream of the chief cupbearer. Here's what it means, says Joseph. In three days you will be restored to your former office as cupbearer. Then he added, when that happens, remember me. And explained a little about his own plight and innocence. When Joseph recounted his troubles, he did not criminate harshly on his brothers or Potiphar or Potiphar's wife. He simply said, I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here in this land I have done nothing that they should put me in this dungeon. We make a great mistake by trying always to clear ourselves. We should be much wiser to go straight on, humbly doing the next thing, and leaving God to vindicate us. At the end of the day, what a triumph God gave to his servant. There will come times in our lives when we shall be misconstrued, misunderstood, slandered, falsely accused, wrongly persecuted. At such times, it is very difficult not to act on the policy of the people around us. They at once appeal to law and force and public opinion. But the believer takes their case to a higher court and lays it before God. We are prepared to use any means that may appear divinely suggested, but to rely much more on God showing our innocence than our own most perfect arrangements. We must be content to wait for months and maybe years until God arises to avenge his cause. When we care only for the judgment of God, then what a clearing up of mysteries, misunderstandings and what vindication of character there shall be. In all the discipline of life, it is of the utmost importance to see only one overruling, ordaining will. If we view our imprisonments and misfortunes as a result of human malice, our lives will be filled with bitterness and unrest. It is hard to suffer wrong at the hands of man, but it is a truer and more restful view to remember that all things are under the law and rule of God. And though they may originate from the spite and malice of our fellows, before they reach us, they have to pass before the divine presence and be transformed into his own sweet will for us. Remember me when it shall go well with you. It was a modest and pathetic request that Joseph made to the great officer of state to whose dream he had given so favourable an impression. Some, however, have said that he had no right to ask this man to plead his cause with Pharaoh. Instead of trusting God, he relied on the help of a feckless man. There may be some truth in this, but it brings us no credit to look harshly on the captive in the hour of his soul's deepest anguish. The strongest faith has wavered all at times. Elijah sank down in the desert sand and asked that he might die. John the Baptist, daunted and despondent, sent from his gloomy cell in Herod's castle to know if Jesus was indeed the Christ. Others of heroic faith have passed through darkness so thick that it almost put out the torch of their faith. It is at this moment Joseph eagerly snatched at human help, at being nearer and more real than the help of God. Who of us can condemn him? Who of us can but sympathise with him? Surely it shows that Joseph was indeed human. He knew that sometimes an inmate got out of prison by knowing the right person. Nobody was closer to Pharaoh than the chief cupbearer. Hopefully when the cupbearer returned to Pharaoh's presence and had his ear again, he would mention Joseph and secure his release. Many a time when we have professed that our soul waited openly upon God, we either eagerly hinted at or openly shown our needs to those whom we thought likely to assist us. What does my dream mean? asked the baker. Joseph had to admit it had a different meaning. We have to respect Joseph's integrity. He knew that the dream meant the baker was going to die. Who wants to deliver this kind of message? He could have told the baker anything, made up a lie, and he wouldn't have known the difference, as he would be dead in three days. But Joseph was a man who told the truth. He was not winning friends. He was representing God. But what what if Joseph had told the baker all sorts of wonderful things would happen, knowing he would die? How would this have affected his credibility when it came to Pharaoh's dreams? 
The cupbearer would say, I know someone who interprets dreams and gets the right meaning in some cases. He could have thwarted God's plans with Joseph completely. But Joseph was honest and his interpretations of the dreams were fulfilled. The events involving both men came about precisely as Joseph had predicted. The chief butler no doubtly accepted his, to his request and promised all that Joseph asked. Remember me? Of course I will remember you. And doubtless, in the fullness of her heart, he resolved to find Joseph a place at the palace. As he left the prison, we can hear him say, Goodbye, you will hear from me soon. But he forgot. Day after day, as Joseph went about his business, he expected to receive some token of his friend's remembrance and intercession. Week after week, he watched for the message of deliverance. No doubt he invented excuses for the delay. There would be so much to catch up upon, people to see, things to do. But at last, it would be useless to hide from himself the unpalatable truth which slowly forced itself upon his mind that he was forgotten. Instead of being remembered and rewarded, he was forgotten for two more years. It's a fact to easily overlook in the midst of all these dreams and interpretations. But for two full years, Joseph was left buried in that dungeon. Two long, monotonous, miserable years. How awful this realisation was. The human tendency would be, will I be here forever, Lord? I never deserved to be here in the first place, but I didn't complain or try to escape. I also interpreted the dreams correctly and have walked close to you month after month. I've served you faithfully. What I said was true, and the man forgot me. The remarkable man, victimised again and again, continued to walk, to trust, to hope, to lean on God. And so Joseph was kept steadfast. He may have been disappointed in man, and therefore clung the more tenuously to God. My soul, he said, in effect, waits upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and salvation. And he did not trust in vain, for by the wonderful providence of God, he was brought out of prison and did better by God's blessing than anything that had been done by the chief butler of Pharaoh's court. We are often too hasty, too busy, too impatient. It is a great mistake. Everything comes to those who wait. They that wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. You may have had what Joseph had when he was a lad, a vision of power and usefulness and blessedness. All your plans must carry. Every door seems shut and the years are passing by. We need to turn our hearts to God, accept his will and tell him that we leave to him the realisation of our dreams. He may keep us waiting a little longer, but we can rely on him as Joseph can show from experience. So in summary, first the wife of Potiphar makes a baseless charge, which leads to Joseph's imprisonment. Then the young prisoner ingratiates himself with the keeper of the prison and is allowed to have free access to the prisoners. Then it happens that two state officials are thrown into jail on the suspicion of attempting to poison their royal master. The verification of Joseph's interpretation of the dreams shows that he is possessed of no common power. The chief butler forgets about Joseph, but through this God ensures that there is no premature release for Joseph. All will be in his timing. It was after two full years that the king of Egypt dreams his dreams. To the casual observer, there might seem a great deal of chance here. But we know that God was working out, step by step, his own infinite plans. All whom God uses greatly are first hidden in the secret of his presence, away from the pride of man. God is working while his people are waiting. There being me nothing at the present, but everything in the future. A future shaped by God. Amen.